round. Uh, today we have uh, our residents presenting two uh, topics. Uh, Dr. Richard Hall will be talking about xanthogranulomatous polynephritis. And Dr. Jamin will be discussing ablative therapies for the renal. Great. All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, do you mind if I start, Dr. Kellner? Sure, please. Um, I'm going to present on uh, XGP today, xanthogranulomatous polynephritis. Uh, my name is Richard Ho. I do not have any financial disclosures. I'm going to start with a case review. This is um, a 25-year-old female, uh, past medical history of nephrolithiasis, renal abscesses, uh, essentially presented with abdominal pain and fevers, uh, prompting evaluation. She got worked up with a CAT scan, which reviewed a, uh, revealed a 2.5-centimeter right staghorn calculus in the renal pelvis, uh, multiple non-obstructing lower pole renal stones with right hydronephrosis, extensive perinephric fat stranding, uh, and overall morphology concerning for XGP. Uh, she had a fever to 101.3. She was tacky at 130, otherwise hemodynamically stable. White count was 15.2, and her h, &H was 8.7 and 27.8. She underwent right nephrostomy tube placements. Um, her initial urine from avoided sample was negative, but the urine from the nephrostomy group Proteus it was discharged home on peel bactrim. Uh, these uh, are the coronal and the actual um, representations of what we saw on the CAT scan. Um, so she actually underwent right-hand assisted laparoscopic converted to open radical nephrectomy approximately one month after percutaneous nephrostomy placement. Of note, she was on Bactrim the whole time. Uh, the kidney was noted to be significantly scarred down and adhering to the psoas and the uh, posterior wall. The renal hilum was difficult to identify, and about two hours into the case, given the degree of fibrosis and inflammation, the decision was made to convert to open. A Blake drain was left in the right uh, retroperitoneum. Uh, she had an uncomplicated post-operative course, was maintained on ANSEF and gentamicin about post-op day three, uh, but she had no fevers, so uh, we stopped that, um, and he was, she was discharged on post-op day six. Um, pathology review. Um, basically uh, XGP with hydronephrosis and perinephric fibrosis and chronic inflammation. Um, the stone was 100% carbonite apatite, struvite. Uh, she did have some reactive perinephric lymph nodes. Um, here's a picture of her actual, uh, of her actual kidney. Um, she had extensive areas of tan yellow necrosis and hydronephrosis. Uh, there's pale red parenchyma surrounded by white fibrosis. Uh, and on the, um, on the right-hand side, you can see the yellow-brown calculi. So today I wanted to kind of go over um, infections uh, of the uh, kidney, including epizemis pyelitis to epizemis pyelonephritis, and uh, finally XGP. Uh, next GP, I wanted to talk about a little bit of the role of antibiotics, uh, percutaneous drainage, and the different approaches of dealing with eventual nephrectomies. Uh, so starting with emphysematous pyelitis, it's a rare infection of the urinary collecting system due to gas warming bacteria. Clinical manifestation tends to be nonspecific, fevers, chills, upper quadrant tenderness. A mortality rate is around 20%, and the common bacterial causes are E. coli, uh, Klebsiella, and Aerobacter. Um, so the treatment, if, um, if gas is localized to the collecting system and no obstruction is present, it's reasonable to, um, to do antibiotic therapy. Uh, if there is um, obstruction present, um, recommendations are to relieve the obstruction. And here um, you can see on these images, gas within the calyx on both uh, the left and the right. Moving on to epizemis pyelonephritis. This is an acute severe necrotizing infection of the renal parenchyma and perirenal tissue. Results in the presence of gas within the renal parenchyma collecting system or perinephric tissue. So the cl clinical manifestation is more severe. Chills, fever, flank pain. Uh, sometimes you get lethargy and confusion. Um, you usually have multiple associated medical problems such as um, diabetes and uncontrolled hyperglycemia, acidosis, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalance. Uh, um, mortality rate of note is 50% as compared to what I just said for um, uh, emphysemous uh, pyelitis, which was 20%. Uh, emphysemous pyelonephritis is further classified into different types and different classes. Uh, these existed from uh, previous publications. So there's one um, classification scheme from Juan et al. Uh, basically, it's a CT uh, classification scheme. There's type one, um, which is greater than one-third renal parenchymal destruction, streakier model appearance of gas, uh, intra or extra renal fluid collections are characteristically absent. 
Um, and usually more aggressive and lead to death shortly if not intervened early. Mortality rates is 70%. In type 2, destruction of less than one-third of the parenchyma, renal or extra-renal collection is associated with bubbly or loculated gas or gas within the pelvic calcial system or ureter. Uh, mortality rate is 20%. Here on, on this slide, uh, on the right, there's necrosis within the renal parenchyma with mottled gas radiating from the medulla to the cortex consistent with type 1. Just as an example. Here, published in 2000, Huang and Sen looked at the uh, clinical radiological classification, management prognosis, and pathogenesis of um, uh, EPN, which is emphysematous palynephritis, just to abbreviate it. Uh, they, they presented a classification system, class one gas in the collective system only, just highlight as class, class two is gas in the renal parenchyma only without extra renal extension. Uh, class three is gas in the renal parenchyma with extra renal extension. Uh, this is further broken down into 3A and 3B. 3A um, is to the perinephric space. 3B is the perirenal space. In class four, which is the most severe, is bilateral uh, EPN um, or EPN in a solitary kidney. Here, uh, we show an example of class one, which is gas in the collective system only. Here, we show an example of class two, gas in the renal parenchyma only without extrarenal extension. Here we show uh, class 3A and uh, 3B, um, gas in the renal parenchyma with extra renal extension. On the left, um, it shows left side of EPN with the extension of gas to the perinephric space with the white arrow. And on the right, class 3B EPN um, shows left side uh, extension of gas to the perirenal space, which is the arrowhead. And then finally, class 4, uh, this shows accumulation of gas, the arrowheads in both kidneys <coughs> and this patient, <coughs> sorry, of note had um, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. So this is a continuation of their actual paper. Uh, in this paper on the table in, uh, in, on the left in table three, they looked at patients with EPN and the success rate and mortality of different management techniques. Uh, they looked at 48 patients in total. The mortality rate in patients who received antibiotic therapy alone was 40%. The success rate of management by percutaneous catheter drainage combined with antibiotic therapy was 66%. Eight or 20% of the 41 cases, uh, sorry, 48 cases were, unsuc were unsuccessfully treated by <clears throat> drainage and antibiotics. And they classified that as clinical manifestations of unstable hemodynamics or prolonged fever. Uh, and seven of them were successfully treated by subsequent nephrectomy. The overall mortality rates of their um, cohort was 18.8%. On the right, uh, they looked at different EPN classes and their outcomes. You can see increasing uh, percutaneous uh, drain failure and mortality as you increase an EPN class. Uh, this is demonstrated um, in their table. Uh, they also looked at their data. It wasn't in their table, but they looked at patients to see if they had um, thrombocytopenia, acute renal failure impairment, disturbance of consciousness, and shock at initial presentation. Um, uh, they took these as risk factors predicting poor response um, to uh, PCD combined with antibiotic treatment. And they found that essentially in classes three and four EPN with two or more risk factors had significantly higher rate of failure um, of PCD than those with no uh, or, um, uh, or only one risk factor, which was 92% versus 15% of significant p-value. So we move on to uh, XGP. So XGP is a rare form of chronic pyelonephritis. It accounts for about 0.6% of chronic pyelonephritis. It's a chronic granulomatous disease resulting in a non-functioning kidney usually, uh, with several renal stones or staghorn calculus, which is seen at 80%. Um, there's massive, it was first described by uh, Schleigenheiper in 1916. There's massive destruction of the kidney by granulomatous tissue, um, containing lipid-laden macrophages. Exact etiology is unknown, but generally is accepted that the disease process results from long-term renal obstruction and infection. Um, it most commonly occurs in middle-aged women with history of recurrent UTIs. Uh, CT scan is the preferred diagnostic tool. However, diagnosis is not based on, um, on imaging, it's based on the histology, and there's different stages. Stage one is localized disease confined to renal parenchyma. Stage two is the extent of inflammation involves the perinephric fat. And stage three, uh, inflammation involves the perinephric spaces in or abdominal wall. And then the most advanced form 
problems, um, the massive XGP can involve the adjacent uh, GI tract uh, fistulas can also occur. Here, um, this is characteristic replacement of the renal tissue by several rounded low density, about 15 to 18 house per unit areas that are surrounded by an enhancement of contrast medium, resulting in a multi-loculated appearance. These findings are similar in appearance to the paw prints of a bear, are known as the bear's paw sign. Here on macroscopic uh, examination, you see necrotic yellow material surrounded by layers of orange colored tissue almost a little similar to our pathology slide uh, from our case report. Here on microscopic examination, there's three layers centered by a calyx. The inner zone cons consists of necrosis, leukocytes, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. The middle zone contains vascularized, um, vascularized granulation tissue interspersed with hemorrhage. And then inflammatory cells are largely lipid-laden macrophages, which account for the yellow macroscopic color. And the outermost part is characterized by giant cells and cholesterol collapse. Here in this uh, microscopic slide, the arrows, uh, the arrows are pointing to lipid-laden macrophages. So I wanted to talk about first uh, antibiotic therapy. Of note, um, most of XGP publications are case reports, uh, and there is limited publications out there. Um, so infections in XGP are usually E. coli and Proteus. Those are the most common, uh, but you can also get Klebsiella staph, enterococcus, pseudomonas, streptococcus. Uh, and generally, um, it's been, a, it's been um, understood that medical therapy has been proven insufficient treatments for XGP. However, there have been cases of XGP cure with antibiotics alone. This study in 1996 out of Colorado and UCSF was on a 27-month-old boy. Uh, the boy had a right renal mass, worked up after several months of intermittent illness and failure to thrive, fevers, abdominal pain. A CT showed a right intramural mass um, with focal XGP biopsies were obtained, and that was consistent with XGP. Functional studies showed that the right side had a 48% split function. So this child was actually given an impaired course of ceftriaxone for five days, then 21 days of ampicillin, uh, and seven days of gentamicin, and the child was actually discharged home on a three-week course of IV ceftriaxone uh, and subsequently did well. Another Observational study here, um, 76 year old, sorry, this is a stage three um, XGP that was treated with antibiotics and percutaneous drainage alone. 76 year old male, right. Abscesses, um, the urine culture grew staph aureus and cephazolin was continued. The catheter was removed on 25, day 25, and he had a follow-up CAT scan one year later, which demonstrated that the low-density renal parenchymal areas had disappeared, and he had no recurrent infections. Uh, the next slide is just an example of uh, the imaging that he had uh, when he was treated for the XGP. Uh, axial CT image showing significant fatty proliferation of the right renal, si um, renal sinus, hilum and perinephric space, focal low-density um, areas in the arrowheads, and advanced parenchymal atrophy, central areas of high density and renal calculi are observable. Uh, in addition, on the bottom here, a broad collection of nodes extending from the right lumbar, uh, lumbar subcutaneous area into the right uh, perirenal space, consistent with an abscess. Uh, here, this was a, a highly cited study, um, essentially a, a, a observational study and a review of 10 cases. And I'll get to, I think, why it was um, been highly cited through all the case reports. Yeah, it was a, it's a population study of patients over a period of six years from 2002 to 2008. Um, all patients had chronic high fever, abdominal pain, and back pain, palpable abdominal mass, weight loss, and conjunctival pallor. Most cases revealed anemia, leukocytosis, very increased ESR, pyuria, hematuria, and bacteria. Um, so here of note, the urine culture was positive in half of the cases. Uh, negative cultures uh, were understandable due to the association of infection with obstructive uropathy. Uh, so this study wanted to emphasize the discrepancy of the urine culture in the collected versus the nephrostomy culture. And I think this was cited a lot because they, this, this paper actually argued for nephrostomy drainage uh, before eventual nephrectomy. Uh, they argued it because of the discrepancies in the urine cultures. They thought that if you have an nephrostomy, you can uh, target 
um, your antimicrobial um, medications better. Um, they also just kind of made the argument that it might decrease the volume of the kidney facilitating removal. Here's just their outcomes. Uh, basically patients who went under nephrostomy and nephrectomy, uh, they all underwent nephrectomy uh, and their complications and their antibiotic treatments. Uh, this is a, another um, retrospective review on um, 63 cases of XGP between 1995 to 2002 at the Bolin Medical College and Sandman Provincial Teaching Hospital in uh, Quetta. So here I wanted to highlight in their study um, below in 26.5% of patients, um, urine culture was negative despite positive cultures from the actual kidneys. Um, just, I just found it interesting as I found data supporting that last uh, paper's conclusion. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk about uh, the treatment of choice for XGP. Open nephrectomy is the treatment of choice for XGP. However, um, laparoscopic nephrectomy has been shown to be a less invasive uh, procedure with benefits including less blood loss, decreased postoperative pain, better cosmesis, quicker recovery, and shorter hospital stay. However, first reports of his use in management of XGP were discouraging. There were high rates of conversion to open nephrectomy and uh, high rates of post-operative complication. Historically, open conversion rate for XGP is about 16 to 33%. Um, so here we is uh, it, it's um, one of their tables. It's actually one table, but it's a very long table, so I broke it up into two um, slides. Here we see uh, preoperative percutaneous um, nephrostomy placement was in 26 patients, 16 in the open and 10 in the um, laparoscopic. So their indications for the placement of the um, nephrostomy was based on clinical examination. So if they had pain, fever, and or tenderness, if they had abnormal laboratory results, including raised white count ultrabunar function and pyuria, um, and they also uh, decided to put it in if they had ultrasonotic features, including hydronephrosis or internal echoes. The mean, uh, of note, the mean duration of the nephrostomy before the nephrectomy was give or take about nine days uh, in both groups. So in 37 patients, 20 underwent open, 17 underwent laparoscopic. Uh, one patient in the laparoscopic group did uh, require conversion. He had an ectopic pelvic kidney, and the uh, vascular pedicle could not be identified because of dense adhesions. Uh, there were no intraoperative complications. And here on the right, over here, you can see that the mean blood loss and the mean hospital stay were lower for the laparoscopic group. And you can see higher rates of um, post-operative complications with the open group. So in conclusion, um, you know, in my review of XGP literature, there's a low incidence and low prevalence of the disease, which limits, um, you know, good, studies, I don't think it's going to be possible for a randomized controlled study in a, in a way. Uh, in terms of antibiotic therapy, um, plus or minus drainage, uh, that's unlikely sufficient to treat XGP alone, and that's been uh, kind of been shown in the case reports. Preoperative nephrostomy tube placement can aid in microbial targeting um, and surgical management. Some of the case studies did say that the um, nephrostomy tube assisted in identifying the kidney and facilitating hyalur dissection by anchoring the kidney at the lateral abdominal wall. And finally, optimal surgical approach is ill-defined. However, it looks like there are case reports um, showing improving outcomes with the laparoscopic approach. Uh, here are my um, citations, and I'll take any questions. Richard, it's Dan. Um, so if, if, you're, if you're in practice uh, next year and you have the same patient, would you do it laparoscopically or would you do it open? I think I would attempt uh, laparoscopically, just just like they did. Uh, I think it's tough, but you know they they attempted it for about two hours before they converted to open. Uh, I think it's reasonable to try since there have been case reports, and I didn't include all the case reports. There's actually a lot of data um, on laparoscopic approach. It's probably one of the most um, the subjects with the most papers actually out on XGP right now. Did you, did you find anything on robotic approach? Because I mean, some, no, I many would yeah. argue that using a robotic approach would be preferable mm -hmm. to laparoscopic in one of these cases is complex and probably would have fewer, lower reason or lower rates of conversion to open. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I didn't specifically look into robotic, but I bet you there's probably something out there. Why would you say that, Preston? Why should there be a difference? <laughs> 
Well, I think for someone like yourself who is very skilled with laparoscopy, there, there may not, but many of us who don't do routine partials laparoscopically um, feel that the, robo the ability robotically to retract actively with a third arm as well as the more pers uh, ability to, in our hands, um, have more controlled dissection. I mean, I think for complicated radicals, people are using the robotic approach uh, because they feel like they have better control and ability to manipulate the tissue than straight sticks. Um, I think it's not necessary for everyone, but uh, I don't know, I have one of these cases coming up and I'll probably do it robotically rather than lap because I just feel like I will be able to get better exposure and, and, uh, and tissue manipulation. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there will ne there'll never be a difference shown in that for something extirpative like that, where you're not reconstructing, suturing. You can always put in another port if you want, you know, a fourth arm laparoscopically. You're right. Yeah, that pro probably is not. I think, think you know, it, it uh, may just come down to surgeon comfort level. One of my concerns is, you know, these cases are infected and you're, you know, you're going transabdominally introducing, you know, bacteria, which could basically spill over the abdominal cavity. I'd be concerned about high risk of intra-abdominal abscesses and things. And I just wonder if it's just better just to make an incision and stay in the retroperitoneum and stay out of the abdomen. Do you think you can actually do that, though? I mean, many of these, you're taking off the peritoneum and gyrotas and everything is everything is infected. It's not like a radical nephrectomy where most of the time it's in the inside gyrotas fascia. I mean, the few of these I've had, even when we started them with the retroperitoneal open approach, we ultimately get into the peritoneum either way. It's, it's very hard to reflect the peritoneum off, especially with some of the rind. That may not be your experience. I'd, I'd be welcome to hear it. I, mean, I haven't done a lot of these, so. Yeah, I haven't done I haven't done a lot either. Right, but I in the ones I've done, I've, I've I haven't always had to go into the uh, abdominal cavity. Um, I usually think these are three cavity explorations. You know, you start out retroperitoneally, and then you go interperitoneally, and then you may get into the chest, especially if you can try and remove one of the ribs to go retroperitoneally. You know, I think it begs a bigger point, and which is we're training a generation of urologists who are not comfortable doing open surgery and so they're more there's a greater comfort level to do it robotically and laparoscopically and i think um you know that's the bigger issue here um when you're trying to approach some of these difficult cases i i agree dan that the concern of infection uh seems to be there what no matter what approach you go to any any cavity could be seeded and infected but it's just so rare for an XGP, even with gross spillage, which I've experienced before, to become infected. And I put in drains whenever there's spillage of stuff, but um, it's just really rare for them to become infected. Dr. Singh, I've noticed that a lot of these cases, that seems like the kidneys are just absolutely fused to a lot of the muscles in the retroperitoneal. I mean, they're like, you're literally digging into the psoas. Do you find that any of these patients have um, any type of chronic pain issues after the surgery? I don't think so. I mean, is it possible? Certainly it's possible, but I, I tell people that, uh, you know, the, the residents who are with me on, on some of these uh, clinic times for post-op um, visits, that it, it can be very similar to these patients who have very large staghorn stones with chronic infection with proteus or serratia or some other bacteria, where the patients live with this chronic state of inflammation and it becomes their, their normal life. They don't see it as sort of a change because this is an insidious long-term disease process. And then you remove that inflammatory process and there are uh, a fair number of patients, just like a fair number of, of a large PCNL infected patients who, who say that they just feel remarkably better. Not, not just pain-wise, just their overall state of being is remarkably better. And, and it's, it's very uh, easy to understand why that might be because they just don't have this huge inflammatory process. Um, so so uh, I, I've heard that more than I've had chronic pain kind of things.
Tanesh, I totally agree. Echoing that, I, I uh, recently did a nephrectomy on an elderly guy who um, it wasn't sure, no one was really sure what was happening, but he just basically had a very substantial decline in his performance status um, and, uh, you know, very dramatic weight loss, um, ended up having a fall at home, got scanned and had this uh, either a mass or a collection around his kidney. Um, with a very small renal mass, um, you know, what looked like a small renal mass. And the supposition was that that mass had bled and then he'd maybe seeded a hematoma. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, he had a biopsy. The biopsy demonstrated that he had a, a kidney cancer. But what it ended up being on nephrectomy was a, um, you know, a low stage, um, low grade clear cell of his kidney, T1A, um, and a massive perinephric xanthogranulomatous infection that didn't involve the kidney. Um, it, uh, it was kind of a weird aggressive infection. It was invading into the psoas, the quadratus, and the diaphragm. Um, and the pathologists have slides of the infection like you know, in skeletal muscle. And it went all the way from his diaphragm all the way down below his inguinal ligament. It was really impressive. Um, and this is a guy who was in a wheelchair pre-op and the discussion was whether or not we should actually put him on hospice. Um, and he's now, um, you know, thriving, uh, he has gained weight, his performance status is better, um, his feeding tube is out, it's uh, really, really impressive how much better he is. It was a, a pretty terrible case, but he's done great. Yeah, That's great to hear. Of these patients show up in my clinic, refer um, incidental findings of SGB, working them up for chronic anemia, or, you know, again, you know, not, not as dramatic as past patients, but failure to thrive, where yeah, you get an anemia of chronic disease. It's a it's a smoldering infection in your abdomen, and uh, they're not coming in necessarily with uh, recurrent urinary tract infections or renal colic. It's it's an insidious finding. Okay, for the sake of time, um, we sh we don't want to cut into Dr. J. Amin's talk. Um, if there's no other questions, let's move over to Dr. Amin, who's going to discuss his topic. Uh, so for my presentation today, I'll be talking about uh, ablative therapies um, and their role in today's uh, uh, urologic landscape for the management of renal masses. I have no disclosures. Uh, so initially, just for background, um, just as we know, uh, increased diagnosis of incidental small renal masses, um, the era of widespread cross-sectional imaging. Uh, more diagnosis, more, more incidents. While most of these masses are malignant, um, they are treated, um, they're very treatable with um, excellent five year survival. Currently, the gold standard for the T1A lesion is uh, partial nephrectomy. Percutaneous ablative therapies were developed um, and really came into, um, uh, you know, as, a, as, an, as an option um, in the late 90s. Um, and they were initially created as a way. Uh, adapted from treatment of breast cancers and hepatocellular carcinomas to treat the morbidity, uh, sorry, to decrease the morbidity uh, with lower complications as well as lower cost uh, for the patients in the, in the treatment of solid tumors. And that was how they were initially marketed. And initially, they were only really um, used for um, either the frail or elderly patients who necessarily couldn't undergo um, extractive surgical uh, management. Um, but now that, um, you know, further out, we have 10, five year um, outcome studies, and there actually is a fair amount of high quality data that we'll review today um, to, to go over the outcomes for uh, management options such as RFA and cryotherapy. So and just, um, and, and, and this is what we'll refer to it later is, so while the historically um, local recurrence rates were higher um, than with partial nephrectomy, um, we've now seen that there's been lower complications, ability to retreat, and comparable cancer-free survival that has allowed for ablation to be considered as a first-line treatment for T1A masses. This is just an overview of the guidelines. Um, the European um, Association of Urology has maybe the, a little bit more of the stricter uh, recommendations in that they still say that you can offer uh, radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation to uh, um, either elderly or, or core morbid patients. Um, but the newest guidelines um, from NCCN now say um, that uh, thermoablation is used as an option for management for T1 disease. Um, here, the AUA guidelines um, recommended as a 
um, alternate approach for the management of clinical T1 disease, um, and particularly those less than three centimeters. And of note, they also recommend a biopsy prior to ablation. I think the, the main, one of the big criteria that um, a lot of uh, urologists face when um, you know, thinking about referring patients out as patients, uh, who, who to select, who to send for ablation. Um, the only real um, contraindication um, for uh, ablative therapies is uncontrolled coagulopathy. Um, and as we see now in, in the more recent literature, which we'll discuss, uh, the outcomes are, are, are actually quite excellent. Relative contraindications are tumor size, um, tumor location, and inability to tolerate positioning or sedation. Um, Schmidt published the paper in 2014. He created this acronym ABLATE, and it's a, it's a, it's very nice in that it kind of goes over the criteria of um, what makes for good uh, tumor characteristics, something that will respond well um, to ablation therapies, and those which won't, and things to keep in consider um, uh, for for those who are performing the procedure. Um, a stands for axial tumor diameter. Um, there's a higher risk of local treatment failures um, and ablation-related bleeding complications with increasing tumor size. Uh, I'll go over the physiology of each of those different forms of ablation, um, and, and so this is something we'll come back on um, frequently. Next is bowel proximity. Um, for anterior tumors, anterior uh, uh, tumors near colon, our small bowel, sometimes patient repositioning is necessary, and there's some other techniques as well to kind of displace the bowel um, by a hydrodissection. Um, and then also location within tumors for modalities uh, with thermal ablation like radiofrequency, central tumors, those that abutting the sinus fat um, can have treatment failures um, due to stink effects um, from the fat as well as um, large vessels of the hilum. Um, so you have decreased um, uh, uh, conduction of the heat um, for, for tumor killing. Next is adjacency to the ureter. Um, there are some techniques that are used to reduce the risk of ureteral injuries. Um, and then endophytic or exophytic, and we talked about sinus fat. So for in terms of um, some of the things that are done nowadays to, that have allowed for better outcomes and reduced uh, morbidity um, is um, water installation, fair enough water installation. This is actually done by um, some of the interventional urologists also here at this institution. Um, quickly, just to, uh, just to explain this diagram here, um, this right here, my arrow shows up. The thin, long arrow is the uh, renal mass. Um, the open arrow over here is uh, small bowel. And the thick, uh, uh, opaque arrow here is colon. And as you can see, um, there's, there's not a lot of space. There's not a lot of um, area in, in here. Bowel is in close proximity to this anterior tumor. So what was done with this um, black arrow here is injection of about 200 cc's of um, water, um, not saline, uh, due to the conductive properties of water, um, separating and displacing small bowel uh, medially, colon laterally, and this is still the mess here. So now you have a nice window where you have um, bowel um, separated from your uh, treatment zone. Um, the other technique that I mentioned to reduce uh, ureteral injury um, is a uh, retrograde cold pyeloperfusion. So essentially, a single J ureteral stent is placed um, here. Um, so this is a central, a central renal mass um, on MR. Uh, a single J ureteral stent is placed into the renal pelvis uh, with continuous gravity um, installation of five centigrade um, D5 water. Um, these are the probes being inserted, uh, and then these are Im MR imaging. This is immediate post-operative imaging. You can see that um, there is no enhancement in the prior area of tumor, um, and these are subsequent imaging one year out, which shows no enhancement of the treatment zone or enlarging the area of the treatment zone. Uh, and, and in this study, there was a um, uh, technical success. They measured as 88% on post-op day one CECT. Um, and there was a mild urine leak of about 10%, uh, which was solved by post-op day one based on the imaging. Uh, with, um, because they filled contrast, they kept the single J in place. 
um, and there was no strabization, and there was no uh, ureteral stricture and follow-up of the uh, past seven months or seven years. So just to go over the ablative therapies now, um, the common goal of all is to achieve a negative margin, it's essentially a lethal kill zone, uh, five to 10 millimeters. Um, and, and the other goal is to have it uh, a predictable, a predictable uh, zone. Um, the four types of ablative therapies um, that, are, that are in, uh, in practice, the top two are the most common, most um, available, uh, radiofrequency ablation and cryoablation. Uh, newer is microwave ablation, and um, still being developed um, is irreversible electro electroporation. So radiofrequency ablation, uh, radiofrequency energy is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, here we have visible light, um, and then with uh, slightly uh, larger wavelength is infrared, which is here as a heat, uh, which can induce molecular vibrations. So it's essentially a monopolar system where a um, probe is used as the cathode and you have a large um, um, surface area grounding pad which is acting as your anode um, and, and, the, and the key also here is to have a large grounding pad to reduce the flux at that level um, so you have decreased uh, skin burns or skin injuries. Uh, molecules of water are heated due to uh, the rapidly alternating current. Um, it, it, the important thing to note is that the cathode is not a source of heat. There is no heat generated by the cathode. Um, the molecules are becoming heated by vibrations um, secondary to the energy transmission, and it, it disperses by direct conduction between the molecules. Therefore, as the distance from the probe increases, the vibrational energy and heat drops exponentially. Um, Radio frequency ablation tends to use just, um, most people just use just with one probe. Um, so you can have limited treatment area for larger masses, ones um, that may not be able to be within this area, this kill zone. Tissues are heated slowly, 70 to 100 degrees centigrade, and it's maintained for five to eight minutes. Um, by doing it slowly, you reduce the charring effect. Um, as you know, charring uh, can have an insulating effect, uh, very similar to like green light, where if we use the high energy light off the bat, sometimes it's hard to penetrate the tissue further. Um, there's three phases of tissue destruction. Um, there's molecular friction between the molecules, which leads to protein denaturing. Then there's cellular vaporization, as well as um, destruction of the cellular structure and lipid melting from the heat. Uh, this process occurs immediately, and for this uh, modality, uh, it's a necrotic process. There's a necrosis, coagulative necrosis, um, and thus, uh, over time, as you as the body reabsorbs the necrotic material, a scar forms in the treatment area, which is a non-enhancing area on contrast enhanced CTs. The pros of RFA is that currently we have this long-term outcome data. It's been um, clinically used for much longer than the other one. So we now we have 10 year um, um, studies. It's cheaper, it's more widely available than the other therapies. There's a smaller probe than uh, cryo. It has also a hemostatic effect because of um, the energy. Uh, there's hemostasis on the tissue and lower risk of bleeding than necessarily with cryo. Um, some of the uh, cons is that, again, um, efficacy decreases with um, greater than three centimeters of size restriction. Um, you require to have uh, image guidance during the procedure. You're susceptible to heat sinks, so it's not great for um, central tumors. Um, and then sometimes, as, as has been reported, skin burns with um, the grounding pad. Next up, uh, I want to discuss cryoablation. Cryoablation, this is the, the idea behind cryoablation. We've known about salt um, and ice, and ice being used um, to treat the breast tumor pain in the 1800s. The first cryosurgery uh, for a renal mass was done in 1968, but the modern day cryoablative therapy was developed in the late 1990s as we started using helium and now argon based CRA. Um, the, the, the theory behind it is to do two cycles of rapid cooling with slow thawing, and you want to develop uh, lethal temperatures of negative 20 to negative 40 C uh, centigrade beyond the tumor margin uh, for, your, for, that, for that kill zone. The, and then the physiology, uh, during freezing, during the first cycle, um, you have uh, intracellular ice formation 
um, and the intracellular ice formation damages the cell membranes and organelles and apop causes apoptosis. Um, during the second freezing, uh, you now have extracellular ice formation. This is a slower, this is a uh, shorter, shorter cycle. This increases the osmolarity in the extracellular compartment uh, because of the ice formation. Um, you have a um, osmotic effect as fluid leads from the intracellular to extracellular compartment dehydrating the cells. Then when there's thawing um, over, over a period of time after the second cycle, as the extracellular ice melts, now the osmolarity decreases in this compartment and you have an influx of cells or influx of water into the cell that has already had damage to the cell membrane and organelles, causing cellular edema, membrane damage, and cell death. Uh, cryoablation can also cause damage to the surrounding vascular endothelium, which can also lead to edema and local tissue ischemia, inflammatory pathways, and further cell death sometimes known as cryoablation, um, uh, systemic inflammatory response to some of the cryoshock. Some of the pros is that um, cryoablation, um, there's a lot more tailoring that can be done to the, to the therapy. You can use multiple probes. There's also different probes that cause different shapes of um, the ice ball. Um, the ablation zone can be monitored in real time with CT, and it's less painful um, than RFA or microwave due to the cooling effect um, that um, uh, from cryo. As the cons have mentioned, there's more bleeding complications if there's no hemostatic effect, um, and also torque or force on the probes. These longer probes can fracture the ice ball, um, causing renal laceration and hemorrhage. Uh, cryo shock. Uh, which I mentioned is a systemic inflammatory response um, seen with uh, just some intravascular coagulopathy and multi-organ failure. Very rare, uh, but it has been it has been um, documented in publishing literature, and it's it's got a higher cost um, due to the use of argon and helium or helium. Um, the newer is microwave ablation. This was first used for unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma um, in uh, 1997. It uses energy 950 megahertz to 2.45 gigahertz to heat tissue and cause cell death. Um, this means that we can heat tissues to much higher temperatures and much faster uh, to heat than RFA. Uh, heat is directly emitted by the probe um, and thus can penetrate hard tissue and like RFA where there is no direct emission of heat from the probe. Okay. Also different is that multiple probes can be used um, uh, on a singular lesion, or you can actually treat multiple lesions at the same time. Um, as no grounding is necessary, um, there's references to that, uh, it's not a monopolar system, um, and it's also more resistant to heat sink. Hey, can everyone please, can everyone please mute themselves? Right now, so Jay's not interrupted. No. Um, some of the cons of microwave ablation um, is that it uses coaxial tables, uh, cables which are thicker and more prone to heating, um, and then this impedes uh, uh, energy transfer to the tissue as there's more resistance from the higher heat. Um, it also can have undesirable tails of tissue. Um, here on this imaging, as you can see, this is your treatment area within the tumor. This is a picture for a fatal cell carcinoma, but you can see this tail of heat from the probe. And now we have some new um, uh, chefs that have a cooling system built in. But you can see that there's a treatment effect where the heating is outside of the tumor. Um, and if you want to get the greatest kill zone, sometimes the nearby adjacent tissue is affected as well. Therefore, the uh, predicted um, shape of the zone is more va variable, um, so it's not as predictable as cryo um, or RFA. And then um, IRE, electroverse, uh, elect irreversible electroporation, is the newest form of ablation, uh, just developed in 2007. This actually uses no thermal energy. Uh, multiple th probes are placed, and a current of 30 to 40 amperes is passed between them. Um, this uh, changes the membrane potentials and increases the permeability of the cell membrane, causing nanopores. This cell death is via apoptosis. It's not necrosis, like seen with RFA. Um, as a result, there's no effect on living cells, so there's no real injury to blood vessels collecting the system or other connective tissues. Uh, it can be used for tumors near bowel, um, as well as central tumors or hilum, because there's no heat sink effect. 
There's also faster tissue regeneration because it's an apoptotic uh, uh, form of uh, uh, tissue death rather than necrosis. Um, and the cons is that it's also the most expensive, it's newest, so we don't have the um, great long-term data uh, yet. Um, it also requires electrocardiographic synchronization for patients that have um, ICDs in place, and as well as full muscle paralysis because of the um, electric current that's being passed through tissue. Limiting um, patient selection. So, just, um, so now we want to talk about the treatment outcomes. And these are several studies put together. Uh, the last one, this one at all, is, the, is, an R, is one of the only RCTs that exist of open or laparoscopic partial nephrectomy uh, versus microwave, which is what they use at their facility. Um, first off, the first thing to look at for most of these studies um, in, in, in literature for ablation. Um, it's cancer-specific survival. Um, a lot of the older studies um, initially were all and, and currently still being used are patients who have high morbidity, elderly, um, poor outcomes otherwise. So their overall survival tends to be limited by that. Um, it's not necessarily, um, unless they're randomized, in which case, in which most of the literature is, and um, there's some, there's some um, preclusion there. So for cancer-specific survival, uh, it's over 95% in three and five years. Um, it's actually similar to partial nephrectomy uh, for most, from in, in nearly every study. Uh, metastatic free survival also over 95% at five years, and local recurrence free survival. This is what you know most most people are concerned about in, in urology. Uh, the newer studies with these technique refinements as discussed earlier. Um, the, um, the, you know, the, the incidence of recurrence at three to f at three years, five years is around four or five percent. Um, and um, in that randomized controlled trial study, um, there was no difference between um, either open or laparoscopic partial nephrectomy versus open or laparoscopic microwave um, um, after follow-up of three years. We looked at a 10-year outcome studies. Um, for uh, tumor frequency ablation because this is what has been used for the longest. It's a study out, out of uh, UC Southwestern. Um, we see here um, that uh, for tumors less than three centimeters, um, the overall um, sur the survival probability uh, for disease-free survival uh, was uh, uh, significantly um, better. Uh, for tumors that were less than three centimeters, so particularly for the smaller T1A lesions. Um, uh, but overall, this study was a bit limited in that um, since the, their initial or earlier patients uh, were, were had high core morbidities, um, so the overall survival tended to be a little bit lower um, and moving, moving onwards. Similarly, 10-year metastasis-free survival and cancer-specific survival were, were excellent, 94%. And of note, there was also no recurrences after five years. Um, and this study was very important in that it kind of helped guide some of the AUA guidelines in terms of surveillance after treatment for ablative therapies. So what about tumor histology? Can we treat any sort of tumors? AUA guidelines, um, uh, and, and the recommendations um, recommend doing a renal biopsy prior to ablative therapy. Um, if your pathology comes back, papillary or clear cells, should we expect some sort of difference? Um, this multi-center retrospective review looked at 229 patients who underwent biopsy prior to RFA. Uh, median follow-up was 33 months. And five-year disease-free survival rates for clear cells was 90% and for papillary, 100%. It's a significant difference. And the proposed um, uh, uh, discussion, was, uh, in discussion was that the difference may be due to the tumor vascularity. As we know, clear cell tumors are, uh, tend to be much more uh, vascular. They're brightly enhancing and contrast enhanced CT. So this increased vascularity might make them more prone for the deep things. Um, and maybe it's more resistant to RFA. Uh, maybe it's a more, more, maybe it's less of a less of an issue for cryoablation um, or microwave and newer IRE technologies. So, what about management for local recurrences? Currently, there's no guideline recommendations um, uh, for, of any of any guideline institutions going over over this. Enhancement um, is used uh, for for ablative therapies. 
uh, with follow-up imaging. Um, I wanted to mention that post cryoablation enhancement, this is often misleading as these areas can tend to continue to enhance for up to one year post ablation because of the apoptotic method um, that is seen in the physiology of cryoablation. Um, so currently, if there's increases in size of the prior ablation zone, uh, enhancement for over one year or newer increased enhancement, uh, um, uh, most institutions will recommend uh, doing a biopsy of this area, confirming if there's any tumor there or if this is just treatment effect. As we know, post-ablation surgery is difficult uh, due to scar tissue. Um, as a result, um, on uh, review, over 75% of recurrences tend to be treated with repeat ablation and recurrence-free rates um, on a repeat ablation is again over 95%. Not any different to uh, primary treatment or initial treatment. What about complication rates? The complication rates for ablative therapies are much lower and um, rare uh, than surgical therapy, theoretically, uh, for partial radical nephrectomy. Uh, most complications are due to energy being applied inadvertently to surrounding structures outside the treatment zone. Um, you know, there's those new techniques um, that are used by some interventional radiologists as well as other um, uh, uh, practitioners uh, to reduce these risks of injury which can result in urine leak post-operative hemorrhage or bowel injury. The rates of urine leak post-ablation are very low, 1%, 2%. Um, so, so very low even when comparing to uh, partial nephrectomy. And overall studies have found complication rates to be comparable between the different modalities of CRA, uh, microwave, and RFA. Um, this is the uh, one of the largest systematic reviews and meta-analysis study, 15 studies involving over 2,000 patients. Uh, there was a decreased incidence of complications for ablation compared to partial nephrectomy, um, and as well as a decreased odds for, odds for, for the risk. And then uh, finally, what about follow-up? In terms of follow-up imaging, follow-up surveillance, unlike surgery, post-ablation therapies have no final excise specimens. So guidelines which have recommended biopsy prior to treatment, uh, we tend to use CT. Um, CRA, as mentioned before, can have enhancement for over a year after, after treatment, but can involute over time. RFA will have that fibrotic uh, scar tissue, which um, may not involute, but it's often um, misinterpreted as recurrent disease. Um, microwave, we found the involute and has significant tissue contraction there, um, and IRE has non-enhancement as well, but um, since it heals faster, it's been six months. AUA guidelines um, uh, for follow-up recommend baseline abdominal CT um, initially post-operatively, um, followed at three to 12 months following surgery, and then annually for three years. The NCC guidelines, the 2019 new guidelines, recommend for up to five years, as we found that, that the recurrence rates um, are very rare after five years. So in conclusion, uh, we now have longer-term oncologic data, which is entering the academic space showing excellent success rates. Now ablative therapies are now included in guidelines for the management of the T1A um, remass. Uh, patient selection is key. Treatment um, can be tailored um, to tumor characteristics and um, to increase tumor treatment and effect and reduce the morbidity for better oncologic outcome. And uh, local recurrence rates are similar to nephron sparing surgery and can be treated with reablation again with uh, good um, cancer control. And, we're, and they're still developing newer technologies and techniques um, to further reduce morbidity and, in, and increase uh, improve outcomes. These are my references. I'll take any questions. Jay, I, th I think that was a great talk. I was wondering if you could comment on, um, especially early on, one of the criticisms of ablation was that the series often included patients who didn't actually have cancer. Um, we know from partial nephrectomy series that 25 or even 30% of um, patients with small renal masses uh, who receive partial nephrectomy may have benign disease. Mm -hmm. And some of the, at least some of the earlier uh, literature um, didn't necessarily differentiate or wasn't able to differentiate between benign tumors and um, and cancers, but they were reporting cancer outcomes. I was wondering if you could comment on that one. And then two, 
you know, I, um, your comments about cancer specific survival, I think it's important to kind of know that, you know, for, mo for T1A tumors, cancer specific survival at five years, um, even with surveillance, if you look at the disarm literature, um, even at seven years, um, is, is outstanding just with surveillance. And so many of these patients, um, you know, I think we need to be careful that we don't conflate cancer specific survival at five years um, or even beyond. Uh, as a consequence of treatment, it may just have to do with the biology of these small tumors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of the earlier literature, um, you know, because the biopsy wasn't being done um, initially um, or, or very commonly, um, there may have been a treatment for the benign tumors, um, in which case, um, you know, this way most of the literature, um, the, the newer literature um, has uh, uh, Cancer proven biopsies, um, uh, but I think that is a very good point. Um, most 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 people, for, especially for smaller T1As, will, will recommend active surveillance, especially even in these elderly uh, frail patients. So, um, you know, we, we know that uh, you know the the the, T, the T1A T, T lesion T1 lesions um, can have very good outcomes just with surveillance, um, and the likelihood based on just the biology of the mass um, is unlikely to. Um, have biological aggressiveness. With enhancement, Jay, can you talk about, you said that they could have enhancement uh, and not necessarily represent cancer recurrence. Can you uh, let the group know what kind of enhancement that typically is? Yeah, so, so the enhancement can be seen, it's usually seen more commonly with a cryoablation. Um, and it has to do um, with um, the, uh, uh, the coagulative necrosis um, that happens um, post-procedurally as well as in the sense of the cell mediated apoptosis um, as the cells die from the membrane potential changes. Um, so for enhancement after cryoablation, for you're, you're looking primarily at increases in sizes of the ablation cavity and whether there's more enhancement than prior imaging. So that's why um, for most cryoablation, there is a early uh, post-operative imaging to kind of set as a baseline followed by a three month imaging study, uh, three to six months, depending on where, where it, um, based, on, based on practice. Um, and, and maybe looking at uh, whether there's any increase in enhancement in terms of overall volume, uh, more so than just areas of enhancement. Um, so that's but, primarily the difference. That, that is yeah. not con contrast enhancement though, right? So it's different than contrast enhancement you're right. talking it's, about. It's just an enhancement. So uh, the, just, just to add to that, the key thing about contrast enhancement post cryoblation that is not concerning is when it's, uh, it's like a rim of enhancement, just at the periphery of the former tumor, former uh, cryoblation cavity because that's where you're having the interface of granulation tissue, which is alive and takes up contrast, but then that goes away. So you don't really want any contrast within the lesion and certainly nothing nodular. And even a third of cry, you know, Jeff Pollock and I many years ago did a grand rounds debate on cryo versus RFA. And one of the points is that uh, uh, you, you can have that enhancement and it, it'll go away um, and the lesion gets smaller and smaller with cryoablation and a third of patients, the lesion goes away after about five years and it lo looks like normal kidney. That never happens in, in RFA. There was also people from, uh, I think it was one of, uh, Dr. Kenny's co-residents, uh, Mike Michaels with, um, with uh, John Libertino showed that uh, the lack of enhancement after RFA was not predictive of cancer because um, a, 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 the, in their study, this was relatively early on, but they were doing RFA and then they were actually biopsying, um, they were biopsying all their RFAs. And they found that, um, uh, even with non-contrast enhancement, there was a fair number of patients who had cancer despite no enhancement on the CT scan. Whereas that did not occur with the cryo patients. And that, that was used as a, 
uh, a lot of people latched onto that. I'm not sure what people are doing now as a, as saying that biopsy uh, should be performed of the ablation cavity at some point uh, to ensure like, you know, histologic kill. Um, I don't, I, I don't do that in my practice. I'm not sure if anyone else does. If there's no enhancement, I just, I just monitor. Dinesh, what do you what do you do? Do you just do you monitor with imaging, or do you use biopsy at any point post ablation? Well, I never use RFA, uh, uh, um, but uh, with cryo, I just use MRI follow up. MRI as opposed to CT. Yeah. And and why is that? I think MRI uh, images the uh, the bed a little bit better, and I think the digital subtraction. Uh, is a little bit more reassuring when you have the uh, assuming they are not moving and you get good uh, cross registration. The digital subtraction, you just see a black lesion in the in the front, and potentially a rim of enhancement early on. I think is very um, um, uh, good imaging for a cryoablation cavity. All right, are there any more questions? Did you come, uh, another part of the debate, and I'm interested if you, if you saw anything about this, Jade, did you see anything about um, recurrence rates when done laparoscopically versus percutaneously? Um, I didn't look between two, the, the differences for that. Okay. There is some data published, again, by another one of uh, Dr. Kenny's co Residents Ali Moinzada, who's going to be giving us a grand rounds about higher recurrence rates with percutaneous because it's not done with real time imaging, so mm -hmm. um, it's not as um, clear that the cryoblation has totally engulfed the tumor. Whereas when you do it laparoscopically, you're doing it with real time imaging and seeing the cryoblation cavity. Having said that, most most ablations are now done percutaneously because the advantage of avoiding the anesthesia and just mm -hmm. saying, well, we'll just re reablate it if it recurs. Does anyone else have any other questions before we end grand rounds? All right, perfect. So this concludes grand rounds. Everyone have a good day. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks so much. Nice job, Richard and Jay.